mic. Testing the mic. Okay, now mine works. That's not fair. Ah! All right. This is going to be very informal. Okay, you got it. All right. So, you know who this man is. Marcher! All right. Um, in reading the bio in the program, you know, everybody knows you from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Two year fans have shown up. And uh, um, Smallville as uh, Milton Boy and Brainiac. I gotta do that complaint where you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and like uh, Andromeda and. Uh, but, yeah, and where else? Yeah, tor of course. There we go. Yeah, which will probably lead to my question about who's a better kisser, uh, you know, Michelle uh, Geller or uh, John Barrowman. Okay. Okay. Do you want Do you want the question that you want, or do you want the truth? You know, I want the truth. Okay. The truth is, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Like kissing for 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 film is not really kissing in real life. It's it like the more glamorous an image is, the more fake it is. Uh, uh, that's what glamour means. Glamour means literally illusion. And so when you're doing a shot that is a glamorous shot, it's it's more of a fake, which means it's harder to actually achieve. Uh, like like uh, when you're doing what's called an overshot, where the camera is over your shoulder on a, onto a close up of the actor who's actually being filmed. Your job as an actor is you don't get in the light. Of the other uh, of the person who's being filmed, so you have to do your acting, but you can't really get into it because you'll blow the shot. And the closer you get to the other person, the easier it is to blow the shot for life. So when you're kissing someone, it's really nice. And so I remember the first time I, I was supposed to kiss Sarah, she was. I think in the show it was actually faith in Sarah's body, but it was really Sarah in her. And uh, I blew like 14 takes. Because I was like, I was playing Spike, and Spike was really into it, you know? And, and so it would be like, oh, Buffy, I love it. Just cut, 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 James. You're, you're, you're a quarter inch to the left. Just move your head, James. Like that. There you go. And that's too much. There you go. All right. <laughs> Try it again. And, okay, cut. Oh, I love you so much. But cut, James. James, just tilt your head up. So, I, so on and on and on. So, and Sarah was fine. He was just saying, James, stop acting. We all think you're such a great actor. So right now, just do it like a robot, please. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'd go act. And finally, after 15 takes, I got worn down. And I just did it technically in there. And we got the shot. And it looks very glamorous. Because it's really, the glamour is all about the lighting and the music and all of that. I just had to go in there without blowing the light. So, I don't know. You know, we got, we got the shot. You know, uh, but John was a great guest. But one thing I did learn, though, okay. uh, guys out there, uh, this is what I learned. If I want my wife to kiss me, I shave closely. Because that hurts, man. John is like, John's got a five o'clock shadow, four o'clock in the morning, you know, like, <laughs> sand, that being sandblasted, man, yeah, so, that's what I learned. Oh, cool. Now, I learned in researching uh, your life that uh, Spike was supposed to be a limited run character on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but the fans asked you, to, you know, can we have more Spike? Now, how did that make you feel? Made me feel good. Now, how did, you know, uh, yeah, well, how did you learn about it from the producers? Did they just keep calling you up, or did they say, you know, don't go away, you know, don't make plans for next week, or what? Well, like, the thing about Buffy is that, like, Buffy was written by Joss, well, created by Joss Whedon. And for Joss, evil is not cool. That was very important to him. He, he felt like it was a real disservice to humanity to portray evil as cool. But to Joss, and I think he's right, evil is pathetic and often comedically stupid. And it's supposed to be very quickly gotten over and defeated. And that's why in Buffy, when the vampires were gonna bite someone, they would get very ugly. Because he didn't want that moment to be romantic at all. 
Uh, and so when I came on the show, I and the fans started saying, "Oh, you know, we 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 think of him romantically." Uh, that's a problem. You know, if I was Joss, if it had been me, I would have killed Spike off in one episode. <laughs> as soon as I got, I'm like, nope, he's a danger. Get him off. But, 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 but jo Joss Whedon is a lot more creative and a lot braver than I would have been. Um, but I never knew. I mean, I, I really thought that I was about to be killed off at all times. Uh, I would read the, the end of the script first. This was even after like five years. I was convinced that I was about to be killed off because I was such an uh, ill fit for the show. Mm -hmm. And I was convinced, like, I used to hide from Charles all the time. Because I think that if, I, if he just didn't have to see me on the set, he would forget that I was in the show. Uh, and yeah, so I was just trying to feed my family. I was really happy that I was still around because I was a poor theater actor for years. Oh, sure, yeah. And then I became a father and it became really important to try to make money. So I moved down to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so I did everything I could to stay on that show. But I, I had no illusions that uh, I wasn't on the chopping block. It, it felt like I was always on the chopping block. And Josh never told me, you're safe now. I mean, he backed me up against a wall early on and said, I don't care how popular you are, kid. You are dead. You're dead. You hear me? <laughs> so he was a great motivator, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, let's uh, move up to uh, Smallville, yeah. uh, where you play Brainiac, a classic <laughs> character. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, did you go into the role as a comic book fan? Did you? Oh, you did. Oh yeah. Oh cool. So I remember I had a comic book collection when I was younger. It was huge, and. Uh, Every time I went into the store to buy comic books, they would say, oh, this is a very valuable comic book. This is an investment, sir. You know, so you save up your allowance for a month to buy one comic book. And then I, w I went to sell them to make money, mm -hmm. and I got three bucks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I read a lot of comics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. when, I, when I met, when I met um, the creator, Al Goff, uh, who's got a new TV series on AMC called Badlands, if you like fight shows, that show is awesome. Yeah. Um, but I went to, I went, he took me out to dinner to talk about coming on Smallville, and I said, Al, I gotta be honest with you, man. I'm a Batman fan. And he goes, he goes, he goes, why is that? I said, well, when Batman goes to work, you don't know if he's coming home. Because if you shoot that character, he's dead. And the most exciting part of a hero's journey is when he puts his life on the line to help other people. That's the heroic thing. So if you're doing a movie about Superman, you can pull out the kryptonite, and it's fine, and you get that big ending. But on a television show, you can't bring out kryptonite every week or it becomes repetitive. What are you going to do? And he said, oh, James, I got you covered. He's a teenager. He's going to be vulnerable to everything. You know, to his parents, to his girlfriend, to his self-identity, to everything. And we don't have to have, we'll have kryptonite sometimes for fun, but we'll have that vulnerability, don't worry about it. And I, at that point, I just went, Drew. Yeah. You have solved the most difficult character in all of drama to write for. Superman is very difficult to write for, for that reason. And he solved it. And they were able to go for 10 years without getting repetitive. Which is just like a magic trick. Yeah. Also, Tom Willing looks just pretty naturally young. It's not even fair. Yeah. You do realize, and of course, as a comics fan, you realize you are the first live-action brainiac. <laughs> so did you try to bring in more elements of the comic book uh, as you went along, or did you just go along with what the, uh, the television producers uh, wanted to do? You know, it, in the comic, the thing that freaked me out about Brainiac was he was a robot, but he was sadistic. He had that maniacal smile when he was being mean to people, you know, like that all the time. And as a kid, that just freaked me out. Uh, and then the show, the whole sell of the character on the show was that Clark didn't even know he was bad. Like, Clark thought they were going to be friends. Uh, and so it was all about being subtle and being kind of kind, actually. And exactly kind of the opposite of what Brainiac, because Brainiac, you meet Brainiac, you know he's a villain. Like anyone who's green with the red things, are like, that's definitely not a good guy. So, uh, but I remember when we were 
I was throttling Tom Welling in his Fortress of Solitude, which was, by the way, a very hot set. It was, it was, it was like 110 degrees in there, uh, because uh, white reflects light. It doesn't eat light, so the light bounces around. It's like a heat furnace. And it, it, funny side note, you have two characters in there, Superman and a robot that aren't supposed to sweat. Let's <laughs> mop them down, let's get this shot. Oh, my God. Um, uh, but I remember I was throttling him and I thought, oh my god, this is my moment. I can do the maniacal smile. And so just without being told, I just went for the weirdest, you know, kind of <laughs> smile that I could because I wanted to try to get back to those comics. Just a little bit. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, now we're skipping around a lot here because I know these guys are going to have some great questions for you. Yeah. Right? right? And by the way, guys, you can ask me anything that you want. I'm shameless. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it. Um, Tell us about your music career, Ghost of the, Ghost of the Robots. Yeah. yeah tell, talk to me. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I've been I've been playing music in bars since I was like 13, which is a great way to get into a bar when you're 13. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, when I I kind of chose to go for acting, and my guitar kind of went into a private kind of thing at home, uh, and then uh, I was. Uh, I did, I did an interview after I was on Buffy, and they found out that I play guitar, so there were a lot of clubs that were asking for me to play. And they didn't really care if I was any good, they just knew that they would sell a lot of tickets if Spike shows up to play music. And I was oral. Because it's one thing to be good in the bathroom, you know, like, you know, at home. It's a whole other thing to be good enough for people, you know, it's worth money, you know? Uh, I remember one time I was playing a big club in uh, in L.A. and Pink shows up. They come backstage. They're like, Pink is in the audience. She loves you, man. It's gonna be awesome. And I'm like, Oh no, man. <laughs> I, I wasn't under any illusions. Right? And uh, and sure enough, by the by, uh, you know, by the show's over, Pink is gone. She like didn't she didn't stay. She's like, You ruined my you know my image of you. But. Um, then I met a man uh, named Charlie DeMars, who's an 18-year-old. He'd come down from Sacramento, where he was getting a lot of radio play with his uh, with his band Power Animal. And he had come down to shop his album out to the studios, not knowing that it's almost impossible to be heard down in Los Angeles. So he was having a problem with that, and uh, he was having to be staying with his, with his brother, who was my next-door neighbor. And I was just playing my guitar out on my stoop, and uh, this kid shows up, and he's like, oh, you play. And he, we started playing guitar. And he started showing you the, the songs he was writing. I started showing some some of the songs that I was writing. And um, and we formed a band. And he said, uh, as soon as we decided we wanted to do a band, he goes, uh, I think I have a rhythm section. We've got, I've got a drum, drum and bass. They're really good together. I think you might want to check them out. And I'm like, oh, let's, let's get them up, get them down to Los Angeles. And uh, let's do it this weekend. He says, well, actually, this weekend they're in New York at the Lincoln Center playing jazz. But when they get back, and they're 18 playing jazz at the Lincoln Center. Right? So they have, they have, those two guys were like, they were such musicians, they could, they could bubble so perfectly together. But they were 18, so they could hit hard for rock. And it was a great fit. And so we formed a band. We cut an album uh, and then went to tour it. Uh, all across Europe and the United States, uh, and sold out everywhere. Uh, we did. Uh, we've been all over the world. We sold every club out in London. We played Berlin, Paris, Barcelona, uh, New York, Chicago. Like we've been all over the place. We sold everything out. we we are coming out with our fourth album. Uh, I believe it's. We're hoping to get it out by August, and we're playing Sacramento next weekend. So come to Sacramento. <laughs> How would you describe your sound? Uh, it is it is pretty straight ahead. It's like um, respectable pop rock, uh, like Weezer or Ben Folds Five. Uh, it's pretty pretty hard charging rock, but it it would have been good on the radio if the radio was still playing rock and roll. Uh, it's like we call it like yeah. we call it alternative alternative music now, but we used to just call it rock and roll. Yeah. So yeah, like the keyboards have taken over and the computers have taken over, but the rock rock is still there and we're gonna come back. Rock never dies. That's right. That's right. <laughs> if, you, if you had a choice between acting 
and music, which of the two might you pick? Oh, I'll put you on the spot here. I don't have to choose. <laughs> I've lived my life by, by having my cake and eating it too. All my life. And I just say, you just gotta drink enough coffee and you can do both. <laughs> yes, true. <laughs> so, I don't have to. Uh -uh. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, um, let's turn the questioning over to you guys. We've got Supergirl is going to walk amongst you. So pick someone. Uh, so I actually have a question for you about the new show you're supposed to be starring in, The Runaways. Yeah. Uh, have you been shooting on it already? Uh, we have shot the pilot on Runaways. It's a, uh, it's a Marvel comic. Oh, Sorry, guys. I know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's about a group of teenagers that discover that their parents are supervillains. And uh, so I don't play a teenager. Uh, I so I'm a bad guy. I know what you're playing. But the good news is, I play the biggest douche of all. Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, we did the pilot, and the other, the other parents are like mildly bad, and then I open my mouth, and I'm just horrible. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun. Uh, and we start shooting in earnest for the for the series you know, for the series on July 10th. Uh, yeah, and we get to do it in the Disney Studios, which is kind of fun. Uh, but yeah, the, the whole cast is fabulous. Uh, all the parents have like huge resumes. Uh, all the kids have smaller resumes because they're young. But uh, they all have such great instincts, and um, the table read went so well. And uh, Marvel, they said they're they're more excited about that pilot than they've ever been before. So yeah. There's a lot of expectation for me. Thanks for the question. As Super Bowl wanders around. Uh, I was wondering what it's like to play both sides, playing Mr. Fantastic and also playing Lex Luthor. I, Mr. Fantastic, I didn't play. So I could talk about Lex Luthor. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, uh, they, they, my first Lex Luthor was for Superman Doomsday, which was a, um, yeah. It, was a, it said they wanted a more adult Superman. They, they said that movie was for the grown-up fans of Superman more than the kids. So it was going to be a little more intense. And uh, so I tried to play Lex as subtle as I could, kind of very realistic. Uh, kind of like, I imagine like if Hugh Hefner was combined with the Lex Luthor that I normally see, that would be kind of where we wanted to go. And I remember uh, they liked that, DC liked that Lex a lot, and they, they invited me back for the video game DC Universe Online, right? And I, I get it, yeah, and I get, I get into the, the recording booth to start doing the video game, and I start doing my lines, but I'm doing it like Hugh Hefner still, because that's the one I know. And they're, and they're like, uh, cut, cut, James, um, have, have you seen the artwork for the video game yet? I'm like, no. I'm like, can you come into the booth, please? So I go into the booth, and they show me a picture of Lex, and he's in, like, battle armor, he's, like, nine feet tall, he's got rockets on his shoulders and stuff. I'm like, oh, uh, butch it up. And they're like, yeah, please, butch it up. He went from, like, oh, hi, how you doing, Lois, to, like, I will destroy you! <laughs> Good question there. Okay, I am the biggest Spike fan, so I've always been curious. What was your favorite part about playing as Spike on the show? The favorite? Oh, man. Oh, the word action. <laughs> I hated the word cut. I mean, I, I to choose one scene is almost impossible because I feel like every scene was my favorite scene. It was just like a kid in the candy store. I, I got to play a character that, the, that, that all the writers wanted to write for, and I got to be just horrible to the lead, which is really delicious on a TV show when you get to really take the lead down a few pegs on action. Um, I remember uh, there's a film at the end, like, you know, the blooper reel? Mm -hmm. And it's a little film that's made for the for the rap party at the end of the year that show the cast and crew all the funny behind the scenes stuff yes. from the year. And I'm never in them. <laughs> wow. Never in them. And after about three years I went to Joss and I was like, 
what, you don't like me? I'm never in the gag room. He's like, no, I like you great, James. You're just boring. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, man. And he goes, whenever, no, he said, whenever I call cut, you do the same thing for three years straight. You do exactly the same thing every time. You look down, make sure you're on your mark. You go straight back to your chair. You pick up your script and you study your lines, which I appreciate. Which is great, but it's not good for a gag reel. I'm sorry. He said, so you're boring in between takes, but once I call action, it's like I'm releasing a tiger, which is also great. Uh, yeah, but I mean, the word action, like everything. Also, everyone else has to shut up and I get to talk, you know, like, like on a set, there's a hundred people talking and then and everyone's in your face and, and we got to paint your this and you got to paint your that and all of this stuff. And then this beautiful word action comes along and it becomes like a church. It's this beautiful silence and you can hear the wow. littlest whisper, and then I can go to work, and I can actually do what I'm, the one thing that I know how to do. Yeah. Thank you. Spike is the best vampire ever. <laughs> so does this mean on Runaways you're going to be, you know, like acting up between scenes now to a private oh, I can't, the... I can't, I just, I, I'm one of those geeks who, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy on the set who's like, boy guys, isn't this fun? <laughs> Every time. And, and, and I, I want to put everything I can into the acting. So as soon as they call, I've got things i got to rehearse, i got things to think about so that I'm ready, so I'm not going to change. You know, That's good. That's good. We have a question over here from this young man. In the super I like that young stuff. I thought. Uh, We've already established your resume is so rich within the genre of superheroes, supernatural, all of that. I'm not going to, especially with Buffy and Smallville, so I'm not going to ask what was your favorite role. I'm going to ask what role did you have the most fun playing? <laughs> all of them. All of them. Like, like, when I was doing Smallville, Tom was really smart in the beginning. He told the producers, don't tell me what's going to happen later in the season, because I don't want to have to pretend that I don't know. I want to go through this journey with Clark. I want to be Clark. So he thought we were actually going to be friends in the beginning. And like, I knew, of course, I'm going to kill you, or I'm going to try. <laughs> and, and I just remember the scene where like, we're like looking at the moonlight, we're, about, we're in the barn on the second floor, and I'm like, Clark, you have to forgive yourself. It's all about forgiveness and love yourself as well. I'm giving him all this great advice, and I'm just thinking, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and Tom, Tom is buying it, you know? <laughs> and then in between cuts, he's like, we're going to be the best of friends. It's going to be great. My character doesn't have anyone who understands me. Oh, oh, oh. No, you're dead. <laughs> no, that's, every role has has some delicious stuff going on uh, that uh, that I will take to my grave. It's just an, an amazing experience. I remember when I was doing this horrible movie called Dragon Ball. Horrible. And. They didn't want to use a stuntman because they were bad producers. <laughs> and like, I, I'm known for doing a lot of stunts, but I'm not a stuntman. And uh, they had a stunt guy, Danny Hernandez, one of the best in town. He was supposed to be the stunt guy, but they didn't want to put him through the four hour makeup for money reasons. They just wanted to put like a pullover mask and it just didn't look good. And I remember realizing that they were never going to use him. They called me to set. Danny is up on a 17 foot tall cliff. And the, the gag is, is that the character, Piccolo, is the one we were playing, was going to get sucked off the cliff by a magical pot, a makubaka. And he gets sucked off, and in the movie, he gets sucked off, and he starts spinning down into the pot. So the first shot was just to jump off the cliff. You're wired, of course. Jump off the cliff and get lateral and start, start turning, which is a little bit dicey. And then another shot... You know, where you're turning faster and then computers take over, etc., etc. But the first shot is to get off that cliff. And Danny's up there, and, uh, and action is called. Danny, you know, sucks himself off the cliff and goes into the roll. But he oversells the, oversells the jump a little bit, and he comes slamming back against the cliff and just cheese grates across the cliff for about 15 feet, 
and they lower him down. He's like twitching and giggling because stuff men are never hurt. <laughs> like that. And, and, and they get Danny down, the paramedics go over to him, and the director turns back to me and goes, Are you ready? <laughs> and I'm like, Can me? Like, can I see the playback? And I'm looking at the playback, and you know, Piccolo's face is like this tiny, you know, tiny little figure in the frame. And I'm like, dude, they'll never tell. And he's like, it's a movie, James, we'll be blown up. Go, get, get up there. And I did the gag, and I got it in two takes, and when they lowered me down to the floor, and they're unhooking me, the head of stunts walks by on the radio, and he goes, well, we got away with that one. <laughs> so, like, these are, like, these are moments that you keep, you know? And, 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 and I'm, I'm so lucky, because my life is full of them. Every, every movie I've done, I've got, I've, there are delicious, wonderful things that have come from me. Even when they suck. <laughs> yeah, well, we've got time for one quick question. Uh, Supergirl, find us a question. Hi, uh, Edward Normal, Illinois. Uh, so you've made some pretty ex like awesome contributions to uh, the extended Buffyverse in the comics. So I was wondering if we could look forward to any more of that in the future. That's a good question. I uh, yeah, I've written a couple of comic books, um, and they would like me to write more. And I have been in talks with David Fury, who was one of the writer producers on Buffy and Angel, about writing together. And we have we've met a couple of times and gotten a story off the ground. And then we get a big project that takes us away. Uh, and right now he's producing a live action Tick, uh, which is going to be awesome. yeah. Like, the Tick was written by the guy. Like, okay, the, the Angel episode with the puppets was written by Ben Englund wrote that script, and he's the guy that created the tick. So now David and Ben are, are teaming up to do the live action version. There's, there's been other versions of the tick, but it's never been in the control of the guy who created it. So this new one is actually going to be good. Uh, the good news is, is they're going to put me on that show. So I got to yeah, I would love. Uh, I would love to. We're not done with the script yet. You know, we've got some ideas floating around, but but we've been interrupted by projects, unfortunately. So you'll have to wait. Okay. Well, that's great. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say in closing to your Smallville, Torchwood, uh, Buffy fans? Anything? Yeah. Um, if you supernatural, great guys, by the way. Big Beth, uh, Ghost in the Robots. What um, else have we got? I have a show on the internet as well called Vidiots, which is about two guys that travel the world and are fools and don't understand anything they, they come in contact with. And we're just finishing up the first season. It's very popular. Uh, it's insanely expensive. It's a subscription. It's $1.30 per episode. So, uh, but, uh, but it's really good. So you can go online to uh, vidiotsonline.com and sign up for that. Fantastic. Well, everybody. It's a big hand for Mr. James Marker. Thank you. I love you guys.